if I had gone in there in my marked unit, I would have probably just rolled up on what I thought was two intoxicated males in a sexual relationship. One was just too drunk. I'm like, hey, you guys need to get a ride and get out of here. Right, right, right. But I walked up on foot and saw one of the most horrible things that I ever could imagine. Yeah. And that doesn't wild. happen if you don't get out of the car and start walking around. You never know what you're going to get. One of them, one time. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Street Cop Training Podcast. I'm your host, founder and CEO of Street Cop Training. My name is Dennis Benino, and I'm dressed down today, wearing a t-shirt. It's a beautiful day here in April 2023, eight days before the conference, well, for us to start. We're excited for that. It's been chaotic. All sorts of fun shit going on, and uh, it's about 93 degrees outside in New Jersey. Pick a Great day to come to New yeah. Jersey, dude. Yeah, the weather's really nice, actually. So I opened a pool on Monday. I called my pool guy on Friday. I was in Florida, and I called my pool guy, and I said, hey, can you guys open my pool? He goes, yeah, we're coming in like two weeks. I went, no, no, no. I meant like Monday. He's like, why Monday? And I said, because it's going to be like 90 degrees for three days. And he's like, yeah, I, I yeah, I guess, <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> so they're like, uh, they came down Monday. I turned the heater on, got the pool up to about 92 degrees, and- they had their first pool day yesterday for 2023. And people don't know if you're from the South. In New Jersey, the North, the Northeast, the Northwest, when you have a pool, in the fall, you have to close it. And in the spring, you have to open it. Uh, because you, unless you plan on paying $1,500 a month to heat a pool throughout the winter, which you're never going to use anyway, uh, you know, you're you're not able. It's like a, like our boats, right? People yeah. don't realize in New Jersey. You got to winterize your boats. You yeah. take your boats out of the water. They get shrink wrapped. They take they get pulled. It all gets winterized. All the lines get blown out, antifreeze, the whole nine. So people don't realize that when they're from Florida or Texas, right? You don't yeah. got to close a pool in Texas. No, we barely even have seasons. I feel like we have summer and a light fall. Just, you know, coming from the north down to there now. Um, I've got, I've softened up big time being down there now, though. Like what used to be like nice, cool, you know, nice, warm, comfortable weather is now freezing. You know, uh, I don't know. I just, you, you adapt and you get soft to the, the nice warm weather down there. Dude, um, it's hot down there. It is hot. I mean, it, it's similar temperatures today, but that's pretty consistent. Um, I mean, even in February, we had some times where it got into, a, you know, the 80s a lot and it was, you know, water days outside and pool days. And so, but I know just being from New Jersey, the minute you get any kind of warm weather living up here, you have that knee jerk reaction, even if not just for your kids, but for yourself to throw on shorts. Like people are wearing shorts the minute it hits like 50 degrees. Up here, oh, yeah. You know, just dude, all the outdoor bars are yeah, packed, right? I know. Yeah. Today, if you went out anywhere that has an outdoor yeah. bar right now, it's packed today. Yep. Go to down the shore. I guarantee you it's packed. Patio bar is yeah. probably packed. Yeah. The line, the exit coming down, coming down the turnpike to go to the shore exits was just already way backed up. People just, they long for that weather and any inkling of it showing itself. People are just jumping on it, trying to get, you know, get a piece of it. So people don't realize when you're from the North and namely the Northeast, I can speak on that is as soon as mid May hits, it is a frenzy of nonstop backyard barbecues <laughs> and going out for about three and a half months, and then it just stops. People literally stop going out in like September 15th. They're just yeah. like done <laughs> with going out. They're like, I'll see you guys back again in May and we all start going out again. Yeah. It's very interesting. It just becomes a dormant state for the most part. Yeah, and it's not just the short times that become like uh, basically vacant. It's just everywhere people just decide that there's like, I don't know if it's just a line in the sand they create and they just don't want to do anything anymore. Well, if you don't recognize the voice, it's our instructor. Uh, probably... One of the most profound classes that we have now. And I, I, th I don't know if I told you this, but I think I did. I texted to you. guy <laughs> came up to me like three weeks ago and he's like, hey, I, I just took uh, just a Craig Myers class. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And I was like, he's like, yeah, it's better than yours. And I was like, uh, yeah, I mean, thanks. Uh, okay. He's like, no, yours is good. He's like, but his is just better than yours, dude. And I'm like, yeah. And so I texted you and I was like, man, I'm just so happy that, um, you know, if if people are taking over for me, I'm glad they're even better than I am, which is great. So, folks, um, I can't emphasize it enough. You are missing out. This is probably one of the top five courses in the country. I don't need to sell it. I just don't want you to miss it. But, dude, thanks for being here today. Just flew in from Texas. Yeah, I appreciate it, Dan. And uh, definitely, you know, 
humbling being in here. And this is my first time in the podcast room actually doing this in person where we actually have some good quality video, good quality audio. Otherwise, it's been a Zoom conference where it's grainy. I'm sitting in the office trying to like make sure the door stays closed from some someone I work with walking in wanting to jump in behind the camera thinking it's funny, you know? And, uh, <laughs> it's funny, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Because we, we have a lot of guys who are pro, pro street crop and all that. And so they know what I'm doing and full support top to bottom. Um, it's really good. I mean, even my, my, my chief at my agency, he's on the street cop group, the Facebook. Oh, that's cool. He jumps in there and comments and stuff. That's awesome. Super dude. supportive. Um, it's good. I wouldn't be able to. I wouldn't be able to do this if I didn't have that support. So really, it's the first thing you do that. when you land in Jersey. Go right for a cannoli. You just stop. Oh, uh, yeah, slice of pizza. Yeah. Oh, it's different. That's the one thing. So like Italian food um, doesn't exist in just, Texas. It's just not the same. Pizza, Italian food. There's things that just don't exist, like bagels or a breakfast sandwich. You know, things that we get here and we, uh, you know, we're just so used to as being staple and. You know, we get accustomed to. They're not, you know, they're not down there like they are up here, and you don't miss them until until you don't have access to them anymore. So obviously, there's still things about Jersey that I miss. I, it's, I'm born and raised from here, um, and although Texas was the best move I could have made, family wise and career wise, I'm, I'm always going to love Jersey and have a special place for it. Like the class I'm teaching tomorrow, I'm teaching East, East Rutherford. Um, it's going to be packed. It's got over 70 guys going. Um, and it's it's going to be awesome. I think I'm going to come to that. Yeah, it's on my itinerary tomorrow. I have a podcast with Lauren. Yeah, I'm going to just postpone that, and I'm probably yeah. going to your class. And this is, so this is my first time coming back around to Jersey. Again. You start at 8 tomorrow? Yeah, 8 a.m. Yeah, 8 to 5, so appreciate you if you can make it up there. I'm coming up. Class has changed so much since the I'm first time. I'm coming up. Good. All about it. You're, you're going to enjoy it. So class has changed so much from the first time that I filmed On Demand in September of last year that we are refilming On Demand tomorrow. I'm going to bring the Mercedes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you picked me up on the way. Then. Yeah. yeah, not a problem. Yeah. But it's changed so much since the first time I filmed it back in September last year here at headquarters that I, I felt the need to refilm it tomorrow um, because I've changed so much. I've added so much different footage in there. I've added full blocks of instruction and and taken out others that just were did not stand up to what I'm teaching now. Um, I, I've changed that with fresher footage because I'm still actively doing this stuff. Like I, I practice what I preach. Um, I still go out there with my guys and we still hammer and I'm still mentoring all my guys to get them into stuff. Um, recently, we just had a, about 14 rookies hit the streets off of uh, field training and on their own. And I we got several on my evening shift. And they're just all about it. And every shift brief is a training moment. They love it. I'm teaching them behavior. We're going through stuff. Like, you know, when not everyone has the gift of it, you know. But I got a few guys who have the gift. And they just want more and more of it every day. And they're going out and getting into stuff and just hunting. And it's it's a beautiful thing. You know, oh, I love it's it. the best. Yeah, it's the best, man. What about the people that, you know, may not have the gift are they still going out and trying to get after it too yeah for sure and i love that tenacity you know because yeah maybe they don't have the gift right away but you can still do damage with oh, good yeah. tactics Bro, even listen. if you don't have the gift of gab you can still see that law exactly and that's a prime example of that like you can still go out and do damage by doing traffic enforcement getting a warrant getting pc to get in their pockets search incident to arrest things of that just good solid police work can still absolutely make a huge dent in the criminal population because not everyone's going to have that gift of gab and that's okay as long as you use good tactics you you know you know your job right knowing the job is so big and if you know case law you know traffic code you could still be a force to be reckoned with out there even if maybe you're not the, the guy that's got the nose for it every two seconds you know you bro i really can literally it. teach uh, a man or woman in this field how to be so impactful, so significant by explaining to them, like, go out and enforce seatbelt law. And I don't mean write tickets for people not wearing seatbelts. I'm saying look for seatbelt violations only. Yeah. Stop a car. Yep. You're not wearing your seatbelt. You need to see your ID. Don't have your ID. Just know what to do when somebody's lying about who they are. Yeah. And you will have more arrests and you will actually have some big arrests yeah dude because i try to explain to people and I, I talk about this in my class last year when i went to harris county texas not harris county uh what's what's the county that houston's in harris, harris. Oh, yeah, yeah harris yep. harris county texas fox news put a thing out that said there were fifty thousand outstanding felony warrants in harris county texas alone yeah. and i tell the story in class and you know I, I went to harris county three days later i didn't see fifty thousand people walking around yeah so we know they gotta get from point a to point b somehow and they're probably not going to be the driver in the car and putting themselves in a position to have to reveal their identity even if they're in a bumper to bumper crash or yeah. anything for any reason for being stopped so where are they they're passengers in cars yep. so how do you get to these passengers it's just something as simple as a lot of times they forget to wear their seatbelts. you don't have to write a ticket and the beautiful thing is if you have 
good identification and you're clean and you're still not going to get a ticket, yeah. the guy or girl who you're like, hey, you know, I'm not going to give you a ticket, but I just need to see your ID. And they're like, yeah, here's my ID. Yeah. You go back and like, hey, listen, you're not getting a ticket for your receipt. Just make sure you receipt belt. They're like, this cop's amazing. Yeah. This cop's phenomenal. Yes. But it's the guy or girl who's like, what? Because they have a fifty thousand, hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollar warrant for their arrest, and that's how you catch them. And boys yeah. and girls, there is no easier way and no cleaner way to get involved in being proactive than that. Just know that what your options are when somebody begins to lie about who they are, because they are going to offer you false information, and that's where you need to know what you can do legally in the criminal justice system to ensure we bring them in and bring them to justice. And people are just missed to like, well, I don't understand. It's really simple. You don't have to write tickets. We use the Motor Vehicle Code in compliance with the law and the Fourth Amendment to ensure that we can discover and put us in the right to compel identification and discover wanted people. And I think it's really important for society to recognize why this tactic is so important because I can show you like 28 examples that have been sent to me of people who are wanted for raping children who are passengers in cars for 14, 15 years on the run and finally caught because some cop was enforcing seatbelt law and knew yeah. the game and knew how it was played. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, sometimes, sometimes we are guilty of making something too complex or overthinking mm -hmm. it. And for some of my guys, I keep it extremely simple to, hey, just look for seatbelts or just look for people doing this and try and find a violation and that'll put you in the game every time. And so that's that's ultimately how I came up with my block that I'm teaching in Nashville at the conference. Um, I said to myself, out of my eight hour class, what would be the most important thing that I would take away from my class? And I have 90 minutes to teach it, right? It's like if I had to choose one thing and keep it the base of the pyramid, what would be the number one thing that if I were me taking the class, knowing what I know about it, what would be the number one thing that I want to take away from class and to keep it simple, right? So, and I chose nonverbal distancing behavior, the game, you know, we all know the game, people dipping and dodging, trying to get off distancing from us, non-verbally, non right? In the car, on foot, on a bike. And I show that over and over and over again, and I make it their own mental reps. So now when they see it on their own in real time, even the first day back, it becomes their own experience, even though we saw it digitally, you know, like that we talked about in the past, like that that uh, digital field training for a mm -hmm. proactive officer. And that's what it is. And so I hammer it home over and over and over again, and I show them what it looks like to the point where by the end, they can't not see it when they go on their own. They can't not see it when I'm showing the footage. So that's that's how I came up with my topic for Nashville. And if I get an officer where I only get basically a 30 to 60 minute window to speak to them, even mentoring them, whether I'm at PD, in the airport, anywhere I am, you know, being a mentor, I talk about nonverbal distancing behavior. It is the base of the pyramid. It's the number one thing, but keeping it simple, right? Going back to just the seatbelt, just nonverbal distancing, people dipping, dodging, ducking, what that looks like. If you just pay attention to people that have hypervigilance on you and don't want to be near you the most and then find a violation, you were going to get into some really good stuff. You know, it's so interesting. Um, as I put more thought into where this company's going, digital field training we talk about, right? So yeah. using, people have to understand something. What we're showing is examples of what it looks like when somebody is involved in this. And what happens before, what happens after, what it was. Mm -hmm. And we're essentially programming your reticular activating system, which is in your brain. So essentially, you're recognizing immediately um, what you're seeing in the field, especially if you've never seen it before. We go to an academy, they don't show you anything. Yeah. Right? It's like, it's like a joke. So, and I, I say this a thousand times over. We're going to change it. You watch. We're going to change it. So I still employ this uh, 22 years in the business. And I'm going to give everybody a really an expensive tip on how to get good at doing police work very quickly. And I am addicted to this. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, folks, it is so profound if you're paying attention to the right things. On the Peacock app or whatever platform, which is, I think, whatever company runs Peacock, the first 48 is available in like 25 seasons now. And like there's 60 episodes per yeah. season. I don't know of a better program to watch right now because of a few things. Uh, you got a lot of seasons to go through. You have typically most homicide detectives are really good at solving homicides. So you get to see how they're thinking, what they're thinking about, how they're processing a crime scene, what they're looking for, what they're talking about. This is a great way to learn investigations, but also the best part of it is to start understanding behavior and body language. If you don't know what you're looking at, you'll believe some of these people. But what's nice is 
when these stories take a turn and the person who was the person testifying ends up being the person who was actually the suspect and the defendant. So when you're out in the field and somebody's telling you some shit, you're like, wait a second. I've seen just because this guy sounds legit yeah. doesn't mean he is legit. We start finding holes in their stories. So it's a really good way. And it's a very entertaining show on top of it, but it's a very, very good way of getting good at the craft of police work. It's watch first 48. Do you watch the show? Yeah, absolutely. And I watch a lot of other shows for that same reason. Um, I sit and I watch a sh certain shows and I see behavior as it's happening. I mean, to the point where like I'm sitting with my wife and she's she's just from sitting next to me on the couch. She's like, oh, doors open prior, right? Or doors open. Oh, he's put me on here. Oh, it's going to happen. Or this. Oh, there's the cigarette. Like she's just heard it all and seen it yeah. all. And she's so versed in it. But you can learn a lot from watching like game film. And I talk about that. Watching game film is so important. I mean, we do it at all levels. I started in high school and into college of sports, watching game film and watching plays and watching certain indicators. And I translated that into police work. And I'm huge on mental reps. Um, we show over and over again what certain things look like, what they mean, what resulted of, uh, you know, from that behavior changed to the point where, you know, in class, by the end of the class, guys are like, oh, there it is. They're laughing. They just, you can't not see it. They're like, yeah. oh my gosh. Because we show, like we talked about, we show the, the, we show certain clips in the beginning, short windows of behavior with a ton going on where guys, when they first watch, they're like, ah, oh, I don't really see much going on. And by the end, they're like, holy cow, here it comes. Here it is. There it is. There it is. Oh, there it is. There it is. You know, like, and uh, that's the beauty of it. By the end, seeing them just being able to make mental recognition or, you know, making recognition of those things happening on the screen. And then all the messages, I know, you know, from getting all the messages, I'm getting all these messages of guys be like, Hey, I saw it in real time. I looked for the clusters of behavior. I looked for all these different things and it's super rewarding, but it just, it further justifies what we're teaching works, you know? Um, and it's, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome to see. Yeah. Behavior is such an important thing for cops to know about. And, you know, just to give some more insight where you can find more of this stuff, Many of you have Disney Plus as the app. Yeah. If you scroll over four or five categories to the National Geographic one, you can watch shows like Drugs, Inc., How to Catch a Smuggler, Behind Enemy Lines, Marianna Van Zeller, uh, I mean, do, uh, Underworld, Inc. There are so many programs. And, and essentially, when you watch How to Catch a Smuggler, it's CBP, uh, you know, yeah. customs guys at the airports and at the borders yeah. looking for body language and behavior yeah. and oddities. And then you can watch when these people are getting interviewed – and who came up clean and who didn't, and what what they think was going on, and the lies, and you get really good because you're basically in field training with the talented guys and yeah. girls that they they're not the guys literally in the warehouses pulling pallets off. And these are the people that they know know how to find body smugglers, yeah. and um, you know, then people were like, "Oh, I don't know how criminal organizations work." There's like 900 episodes on how criminal organizations work, what goes on in Mexico, what goes on in yeah. Colombia, how all this stuff gets here, how it's coming here. So if you are obsessed or even interested with this craft, there's so much to know about it. And you shouldn't be ashamed of it. You shouldn't let any of these liberals make you feel like you shouldn't know how to do this stuff or that we're picking on people. These are yeah. bad people. I honestly said it a thousand times. I can guarantee you the cartels are funding a lot of these liberal-based, you know, like, campaigns they don't want yeah. any interference with interest, delivering yeah. tons of narcotics to like chicago so what they do they get these guys they back them yeah they, i mean they have a vested interest in sure someone who's soft on crime and not wanting to take swift action mm -hmm. um but yeah you can learn so much from watching those videos i mean i've learned so much about certain ways to manufacture narcotics and how they're used by users so I, obviously I, I would never know unless i watch that because i'm not you know I, i'm seeing how are people making crack how are people cooking it? What do they need? What kind of stuff, devices and different things are they, would they consistently have to make that stuff? So when I stop in a car and I see all these things, now I know, yeah, I got someone who's probably cooking crack. You know, I got a dealer. I got some, or, you know, I got someone who's strung out or a user and this is what they've got. You can learn so much from watching people who have, unfortunately, in a drug addiction, a drug addiction and apply it to law enforcement. Um, you can learn so much. There's so much out there. Even just on YouTube, there's so much out there. And obviously, you want to vet your sources, but there's a, there's a lot of really good stuff out there uh, to learn from um, and, and take away. So, and it's free and it's easily accessible. But you got to sit down and put the time in. Yeah, on your dude. Own, you know, I mean, listen. How many times as a cop do you sit down and put the time in? Down wire, right? DMV waiting for a tow truck, forty five, yeah. fifty minutes. Yeah. Hospital detail. You go to a hospital detail. Guys are showing up with their, like their PlayStation Four. Like what? Do you, yeah. Dude, how about we learn our craft? This guy's handcuffed, double to the bed. You keep yeah. your eye on him. And uh, take your smartphone out, log into the hospital Wi-Fi, and start getting your education down. I even like micro-expression training, right? So yeah. when you learn micro-expressions, you speed read people's faces. And uh, it's good to know. I think in every – by the way, right after you're done, we have Chris Voss coming yeah. on the 
the podcast. Uh, if you don't know Chris Voss, he's a top FBI negotiator, wrote a book called uh, Never Split the Difference. It's one of the few it's books. It's very I've, popular. Dude, I've read that yeah. book three times. Yeah. Three. Well, I listen to it. So people don't, you know, people know I don't read books. I listen. I'm an audio learner. Yeah. And I mean, I could read it, but I don't have the time. Yeah. I just rather work out at the same time. Yeah. That book is fantastic. I can't wait to do it. I got so many things I'm going to say to him when he comes on, but we're excited to have him. But this guy transformed these skills into one of the most significant business trainers. So he teaches top level business executives for big bucks on how to negotiate. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah so apply, it's applicable at so many different levels: private sector, public, uh, law enforcement, non law enforcement. You just there's a lot. There's a lot it can be used for uh, in a, in a great way. Dude, I mean, I was I was a realtor, yeah. and I knew body language, right? Yeah. So I would most of the time when I use it the most is when I was pricing people's houses. So they wanted to list a house, they wanted to sell it. And for those of you who've never been in real estate, and I was a successful realtor, and we'll do a little backstory on Dennis Benino here. I had to decide whether I was going to continue real estate or street cop training because I, I couldn't do both. Time, yeah. yeah, I couldn't do them both. And yeah. I didn't want to, you know, not be the best for my clients, whether it's on the street cop side or the, you know, the, the real estate side. And I just didn't have the skills at that time to run two businesses that were doing very well. And I didn't know anybody to take a portion of it to run that side of the business. You know, now I probably would have been able to build an infrastructure, but that was five years ago. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you learn a lot as you go on. But if you're ever going to get into real estate or you're going to sell your real estate, everybody thinks their house is worth more than it actually is. Nobody's ever pleasantly surprised that their house is worth way more than they thought. They've already done the homework on Zillow. And typically what happens is they'll see the guy down the street that listed his house for 150000 more yeah. than it's worth. But it hasn't sold in 168 days. Yeah. So you'll sit down and you're like, well, the guy down the street has the same house as me and he wants 440 for the house. And I'm like, I, I know, but that's why nobody bought it, right? Let's look at the five houses in your neighborhood that sold that look just like yours. And the reason people get so upset about this is because Americans, and I think people in general, are bad at saving. So their whole future is wrapped up into the value and the equity of their home. So the idea is I'm going to sell here in New Jersey. I'm going to take one third of the money I have in the equity of my home, the margin there. I'm going to build something in a 55 plus in South Carolina. And then I'm going to take the rest and live with that, my retirement and my 401k, and I'll have a perfect life. But that whole plan starts to fall apart when they overestimated the value of their house by about one hundred and fifty dollars or $200,000, you know, especially when we're talking about like a three, dollars $400,000 yeah. house. And, dude, there's nothing more difficult than trying to tell somebody, like, your house is worth fifty, eighty thousand $80,000 less than you thought, plus there are fees associated with selling a house. Yeah. And, dude, I remember seeing, like, the the nose scrunches the yeah. snar the you just know the, discomfort yeah yeah and you know like yeah. and then you got to shift it because yeah. you don't want to lose that client you want to yeah. have good communication of like yeah. you know sometimes you go to a house and you're like this house is a piece of shit like why do you think this house is good? but you forget that these people raise their kids here yeah. right and they're just like and my parents were guilty they're of emotionally it. tied to it not thinking from a business and they're also yeah. not educated on the rest of the no. the the, the well, real hire, estate field and that's why they hire a real estate agent well dude I remember yeah. telling them tell my parents I'm like they're like, what do you think the house is worth? And I'm like, I, you know, not, I'm like, your kitchen's outdated. My father's like, the kitchen, the kitchen's <laughs> great. I'm like, that. <laughs> I'm 33 years old, right? You did this kitchen when I was, at 35 I was, something like that. I'm like, you did this kitchen when I was in middle school, yeah. right? You're talking about this kitchen's 25 years old, dude. He's like, yeah, but it's, in I'm like, dad, you got watermarks in the ceilings. I'm like, do you guys really, I'm like, the bathrooms have it. He's like, the bathrooms are clean. I'm like, but they haven't been updated. Whoever's taking this house is going to gut the whole thing. I don't understand. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And, you know, he's just like, I just don't get it. I'm like, you yeah. haven't put a dollar into this house. Then we sold their house in Pennsylvania, right? And we sold it for what they bought it for. Yeah. And he's like, I don't understand. I'm like, you literally own this thing for 11 years and you're getting your money just back out of it. It's a really good deal. Yeah. Right? It's a really good deal. Um, but you decided you did not want to put hardwoods down. You put these bullshit floors down for 50 cents a square foot. So, we can't get money out of it. You guys never wanted to renovate. You didn't even change the beds in this place when you bought it. Yeah. And, you know, you just look at, 
your speed read faces. You just know when somebody's not happy about things, the eyes squint in, right? Yeah, you see, it's hard not to see now too. And so every time I teach a class, I get sharper and sharper on. Oh yeah. And now even when I'm in the- You see more things, right? I see so much more now and it's hard not to see it too. And like, I'll be having a conversation even just with one of my friends and I see them just having anxiety. I'm like, dude, relax. I'm like, dude, yeah, yeah, cool, yeah. man. Like, just relax. Well, sometimes the people in here come in and they're like, don't look at my face, I'm about to tell you something. So it's, it's it's quite funny, dude. Yeah. Hey guys, if you're enjoying the Street Cop Podcast, do us a favor and go with, give us a review on iTunes or Spotify, wherever you're listening to us. Tell a friend. We don't charge anything for the episodes. We appreciate your support. Check us out on any social platform by putting into the search bar, Street Cop Training. Give us a follow. We have a lot of free content coming out every single day that you might not catch here on the podcast. And it's important for you to be able to do your job more professionally. And we also entertain you as well. I know you want to talk about something uh, in particular in the podcast. So let's go into that a little bit. Yeah, so if you know me or if you've been to class or if you've ever worked with me, you know I uh, I am all about foot patrol. I call it the dying art because unfortunately in a lot of places it is a dying art. A lot of cops aren't comfortable or just don't have the, the skill set or haven't been trained on getting out of the cop car, how to work a foot beat, look for different behaviors, look for different things because it is different than when you're looking, when you're in a marked unit and they know you're there and you're looking for reaction to presence. When you're on foot patrol and you're getting creepy out there in between cars and checking apartment complexes, you're looking for different things. Your contacts, basically your target analysis, behavioral analysis, it's a little different. Um, so uh, one one uh, thing that comes to mind is making sure we're putting a police presence, saturating um, your apartment complexes, the parking lots, uh, motel apartment complexes, 24 hour gas station lots, um, especially at night. If you don't put a presence here on foot, uh, you are allowing criminals to feel extremely comfortable operating there and you will lose control of certain co apartment complexes where there is just open air drug dealing, a lot of really bad crime co going on. And so, when I transferred from New Jersey to Texas, I started doing foot patrol again. And I don't want it to sound like it is, but when I started doing foot patrol at night, I was one of the only people really doing that. And I made it really like cool again there. And I had guys wanting to come out with me in like twos and threes and pairs, and we would just start hitting occupied vehicles. So we weren't like, hey, I see behavior change, like in a marked unit. I see behavior change, that's my car, find a violation. No, we were just doing like mass contacts because there just wasn't a lot of people out there anyway. And we were seeing how that initial interaction would go for our behavior change. Hey, how's it going, Brian, Brian Police Department? Hey, let's, and you would see how the reaction would go because the good people in the area would be like, oh, hey, yo, you startled me. Hey, no, I just, I just got home from work. I'm just, you know, just texting my wife, you know, she's at work too before i go in the house okay cool cool and then you get the totally different reaction where they're like holy shit we are effed you mm -hmm. know and we would start working it from there and building reasonable suspicion really quick and not to go down a rabbit hole but i always preach the difference between an okay cop and a great cop is how quickly you can move through from a consensual encounter to reasonable suspicion to probable cause before said criminal can countermeasure it and get out of that encounter because a great cop can work through it quick enough where they're not letting a super superior criminal slip through the cracks in that little interaction time they have, that window. It's huge. And so that's that's a big part of what this company's about, is teaching cops to how to know what they're looking at, how to build reasonable suspicion, how to get there, how to know their job. But one stop in particular really comes to mind. I've had a lot of really good success on foot um, through different tactics. But one uh, when I was talking with Frankie on uh, before the podcast started was, one night I was in an apartment complex, uh, sorry, a motel, a motel complex where uh, there was people trying to park and there was a lot of, a lot of really bad drug activity, prostitution, all, all sorts of things going on. And I had a, a vehicle that was just cruising through the lot. They had done one lap already and I could see that they had like checked in and got a room and now they were lapping back around. It's like perfect timing. So tactic tip, try to make sure they get, if, if they're a dealer, right, they're going to commit to that room and they're going to sell out of that room all night. So like, your people lapping around, a lot of times you're gonna be buyers. But if you are lucky enough to have someone who's purchasing a room and set up for the night, yeah, they might have gotten a prostitute, but you also might be getting that short, small window of opportunity where you've got your dealer where he bought a room and now he's going to be just dug into that room like an Alabama tech and not coming out. And it's just your only opportunity to really get him, right? And they sell those drugs as quick as they get them and it's fast, right? People line up around the block once they know that, that, that they're loaded and they're holding. So luckily in this stop, I saw him do one lap around. I saw this individual and a female get a room and they were coming back around again. And I had I was standing in the apartment, uh, the uh, sorry, the the parking lot, and they saw me and they quickly parked and I was like, hey, okay, park here. And I made a I made a contact with them on foot. Um, 
And during the encounter, the initial encounter, just just total fear, panic, shock, awe, female starts trying to get out of the car already, has to go to the bathroom, right? That limbic triggering and then just having to distance non-verbally from the car. Panic, trying to leave the car with her purse. I look around the car real quick and I'm playing it cool because I'm big on perception field craft. I don't want to let them know that I know what's up. Never show your hand until you have enough units there to deal with that problem and also get them out of the car first, right? So... While I'm standing there talking to them and they're panicking completely, he's sweating profusely, moving around a whole lot, eyes wide. I see him telegraph and look down and I look down and I see several magnetic compartments, like large magnets, right? Large magnetic compartments laying there on the floor. And I don't, and I know that's not right, but at the time I don't realize what, and I'll get to why that was so big. So I get another unit there and so I, I, I build my reasonable suspicion. I see there's a lot of things not right there. They give me their identification. I run them. I find out they have extensive criminal history, extensive tr- manufacturer delivery, like d- distro type charges. And so I get another unit there and he stays with the female. I get the male out. I pull them to the back. And in class, I show like positioning them, setting up for success, where to put them in relation to their own car for telegraphing and look backs. And so I hit him with a question right out of the gate and he does a shutter and he does a look back, a telegraphing move. And then I get him to admit to some small form of probable cause, like the peace offering, right? He admits to there being a meth pipe, something small, low level, but it gets me in. And in that moment, I see that Unfortunately, my partner wasn't very switched on at the time. The female had, he had allowed her to basically exit the car and Mm. sit down. And now she was trying to get up and he was going to let her go to the bathroom because she had to pee really bad. Mm. Absolutely not. She's not going anywhere. We have probable cause. She's not free to leave. Yada, yada. We get a third unit rolls up. We start working this thing. And so I detain him real quick. He already admits he's got stuff on him as well. Just low level, you know, paraphernalia, but we detain him. I don't want him going anywhere. So I stick him in the back of my car. I've got PC. I go up to the car. Immediately, I realize why she's trying to distance from the car. She had several ounces of methamphetamine in her bag, just straight, just fresh crystal shards. She was trying to get off, like out of there and go to the back sure. and gone. And flush it. Yeah. And so then it gets even better. So then I was in searching the car, all those magnetic compartments that were on the floor, um, made to me. After he bought his room, he went under the car and took them off the bottom oh, of the manifold wow. and then put them on the front seat. To bring them in. They were about to go in the room. Yeah. Yep. And they parked right in front of the room. So I was like feet away from just losing them. I was really, it was just a good encounter. So he went behind cover, took them all off. Yeah. Like right up, right under where he buys a room. He felt that cocky and confident. We're out of, out of view though from police. And right. Took them off, put them on the, like the floorboards. And because he wanted them off and he didn't want to do it in front of the room, but he had them right, ready, accessible, and he was about to go right in his room. And then I made my contact right before that happened. So it was like divine intervention, you know? And so even inside those, he had so much, so many different drugs bagged up for sale, a ton of heroin, MDMA, uh, more meth. It, it was like just a ton of different types of drugs, a lot of different counts of manufactured delivery. Um, but it ended up being really good because besides getting two big drug dealers off the street with a bunch of criminal history, unbeknownst to me, actively at the same time, CPS was working a huge case with multiple uh, young children of theirs, right? One, three, five, seven. And they were trying to get them removed from the household because there was a lot of suspicion of drug activity going on there. And when the CPS case worker and probation found out my case and all these counts, they went and they were able to take the children on that and they drug tested the children and all of the children test positive for heroin and methamphetamine. Whoa. Yeah. And they've been since replaced and that I got a letter from CPS and from uh, basically my DA's office saying how crucial my stop was just beyond just a drug dealer off the street saving kids, you know, like, because can you imagine what kind of upbringing you have if you're at those ages in those conditions and you're testing positive from heroin and meth at one, three, five, seven years of age? It's wild. It's it's terrible. It's it's so sad. But you can because we caught that, you know, because we got them off the street, we were able to replace them in good homes, you know, new families' homes as a result of a contact in a parking lot at a motel that has problems. And I kept hammering that place and hammering it and hammering it until after a few weeks. They thought they were snitching. People were snitching on each other. We were doing some kind of surveillance and they just shut down in that park. It completely moved to another like motel completely because people were getting arrested so frequently there. Um, And that's just one instance of the power of foot patrol and just saturating an area and walking up to occupied vehicles. Even if you don't know a ton of things, if you start walking up to occupied vehicles and making these consensual encounters, you can quickly rise to probable cause, reasonable suspicion, and then probable cause. I show in class how many times a good switch on officer who just decided he was going to get out of his 
car, right? The barrier and get out and start walking up to occupied vehicles. And immediately plain view, stolen AR pistol, five grand cash, pounds of dope on the seat. People trying to jump out of the car in distance and capturing them on body cam and then seeing all these stolen guns. If they had not gotten out of the car and just walked up to an occupied vehicle, they never would have been in the game. Because we're so guilty and so many of us are guilty of just driving around. And if if we don't knock it down in our car, we're not getting out and going after it. But foot patrol, right? Park out of you. Get out start creeping around these apartment complexes. I can't tell me how many relationships I've made at really bad apartment complexes where the majority of people were really good, but they were quiet. The quiet majority. We've heard that before, right? The quiet majority of people that live there. They'll tell you stuff like they see me every night walking around like one, three, five in the morning. Guys, people that work shift work, we get off me having a cigarette or sitting on their porch like, hey, how's it going? You know, because we're nice people. And they were like, hey, uh, I don't really talk to cops, but you walk around here every night and you, and you seem like a good, good dude. You need to take a look around the corner from the uh, around the corner of that uh, overhanging apartment right there right now. Oh, OK. I walk around the corner. I had three, three freshly stolen ATVs and and dirt bikes with the tag still on them from a local repair shop down the corner that they had just stolen and placed there five minutes before I got there. And I had hit record when I entered the parking lot and got them all on video and tied the case and made them for, and put them back on that burglar uh, building and tied them back, extensive history. And the tags were still on there from the owners. We were able to call up the owners and they wanted to press charges and we were able to get those guys. Wow. Just just talking to people though and walking around though. And I'd heard, I'd heard like ATVs, like at one point at night, it was like 3 a.m. Like, oh, that's not good. And I was like, oh, let me check this apartment complex. And I hit record. As I hit record, <laughs> this car with like too deep comes out of the parking lot. And I didn't know anything about it at the time, right? But I captured it on video. Those cameras are so yeah. important, dude. Oh, huge. Yeah, that's especially with consensual encounters. That's why I preach. I tell my guys, if you start walking around, your body cam needs to be activated. Because you might walk up on someone leaving a car, leaving a house, and then five minutes later, you might find in plain view, forget a stolen AR in the car, dope in plain view, and now you've got video of him leaving that car at a time to for a warrant. Or you might catch someone on video leaving a house where now a homicide's coming in. All right? You just never know. These body cameras are awesome. Uh, it, there's just it's endless what you can do on foot when you start getting out of the car and doing things outside the box because we've heard it time and time again if you do the same thing as every other cop out there just staying in the marked unit and just driving laps you'll have the same results but if you get out and walk on foot thinking outside the box getting creepy out there looking for people that are having hypervigilance even though they're not seeing a cop it'll put you in the game which you know obviously the one that everyone always asks me about the, the rape in progress that i rolled up on on foot um, that always comes up. Guys always ask me. Let's come back to that in a second because yeah. that's the one that like yeah. blew my mind on. Yeah. And, and, and there's nothing to be laughing about, but when you hear the story, you're going to understand why yeah, it's, horrible. it's a fucked up yeah. thing. It's just like, yeah. it's, it, you, it's almost one of those things where you have to be, you have to chuckle a little bit because it's so insane. As you're talking, I think about the media, the liberal media and the liberal police departments and command staff that prevent police from doing proactive work. And here you got one police officer, uh, albeit a sergeant in Texas in a basically small town uh, for the most part, going out and having such a profound impact and collectively is 700, 750,000 cops in this country. Just think about if people got trained on the stuff that we're talking about, how impactful they could be, how effective they could be, hence the name of the class. Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing I'm going to say before we continue on, my last thing that I want to contribute before you tell your story about that rape in progress, I think it's really important for people to know what it's called in your state, whether it's a mere inquiry, consensual encounter. There's a few different names for going up to people and shaking their hand and saying hello. And there's a few cases that regard this. Uh, I think Florida v. Royer, Florida v. Bostic. But you can go into Google Scholar or Casetext.com and create a you know, 14 day free trial. My suggestion is, is just put in mere inquiry, consensual encounter. Uh, you can run Florida v. Royer and you can just, it's pretty easy to use. I would suggest reading just a handful of cases about what separates an investigative detention and a consensual contact or a consensual encounter and the things that are acceptable and not acceptable. So for example, you'll see a lot of suppressions when somebody's slow rolling through a apartment complex or a parking lot. And police officers, you know, doing what they do best, 
throw the spotlight on, throw their wigwags on, hop out, block the car in, yeah. go up, and start asking for identification. And it's a total game changer. Yeah, so know. the problem is with that is that's an investigative detention, and you need to be supported by reasonable suspicion under Delaware v. Proud. So there has to be – if you had a parking violation, you got it, right? Yeah. It's yours. Yep. If, the, if it's six inches from the curb in your town and it's 10 inches – you got it. You're good. You yeah. can you can compel identification as a violation of law. Maybe they're parked the wrong way. Or city on, ordinances too that fit. You know, some yeah, for sure, dude. Nothing else would. Yeah. So you got to understand how to, <clears throat> you know, essentially justify an investigative detention versus a consensual encounter. But consensual encounters are so important. People say, "What do I do if I have nothing?" Go up and shake their hand and yeah. introduce yourself by your first Handshake's name. Handshake's a powerful thing too. Oh, dude, yeah. it's crazy. Um, get some case law knowledge down on consensual ca- encounters and contacts and what separates those from investigative detention so you don't get them mixed up. Because we want to make sure that we're <clears throat> respecting the Fourth Amendment as yeah. law enforcement officers for sure. And, you know, dude, just to allude to what you were saying about turning your body camera on, if you watch the first 48, how many times some hard charger on patrol locked the dude up that was the killer a week earlier yeah. or had his camera on or stopped that car yeah. an hour after the shooting occurred? And that was the thing that tied, that actually resolved the crime and brought the offender to justice. So people are like, oh, I don't want to be proactive. <clears throat> you don't realize how some of these small little decisions to make just traffic stops alone impact and come back to solving look at the guy from fucking uh who murdered those kids in college yeah who was out there that stopped him 45 minutes apart yeah two interdiction guys yeah. guys who go out and stop yeah so there was all these theories of why they were stopped and again the fbi recanted their their, yeah. their some of their story mm-hmm. the reality was he displayed behaviors yep. they were a they were motivated police officers who were proactive and when these police uh, or these these media and these liberal have no business being the sheriff or police chief say we're banning pretextual stop. Folks, those are pretextual stops. Yes. That guy who was stopped pretextually, when you've banned this guy in like North or South Carolina, this this asshole of a sheriff banning pretextual stops. I just everybody works that sheriff's office, that asshole came out. Uh, run for the hills, turn your gun badge in, go do something else because you're fucked. You don't want to work for that guy. He has no idea what the fuck he's talking about. And pretextual stops are some of the most effective things in the world. You have these liberal media jerk-offs saying this stuff. Folks, this stuff is so important. It does not target people of color. No. It, 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 it solves crimes and keeps citizens of the United States of America safe. And it is so profound. And when you understand what it is and you're doing it legally, it is probably the most impactful thing that you can see. And, and Craig's going to tell you a story right now of what it meant to be proactive and what it meant to the guy who was being raped in the car. And that's a little lead into it. Yeah, so... I guess it really starts with, I go back to not doing the same thing that every cop's doing to have different results. So we have several parks in our city, but one park in particular. So this parking lot's shaped like basically like a a snail shell. This is a weird way to describe it, but there's only one way in. It loops around a little island in the middle and it's got a lake on one side and it's got a high like three to four foot berm on the other. But Every cop every night would just drive in the marked unit after curfew at 11 p.m., right? Only going in there during the curfew hours and would go in there and it would take several seconds to get fully into this parking lot if there was somebody, anybody parked in the lot. And the way you could basically the way you would park in that lot at night, I sat there at night and I wanted to see if I'm looking left to right at traffic going down the main road that par- you know basically parallels it. What do I see if I'm a criminal? And I could see every car that would come by left and right. But I would pick a spot where now there's a business here. If I was driving as a cop car and I saw some suspect in that parking lot or somebody after hours, where would I have to drive as a cop to now be out of view if I made my hard right and started doubling back? And I knew, okay, if I'm a criminal in this lot, I have to get to said street before I'm out of view. For the, you know, to not see a cop anymore and then loop back and where I would need to park. And then I physically would walk up and like literally like creep and get below the horizon of that berm, get behind a tree and then drop into the parking lot in the dark with them, with them not knowing there was a cop there. And I was like, you can't be lazy to have good results, right? Because if I did what every other cop would do, like I said, drive in there and flush them out, I may not have the same results. I might have an individual who has plenty of time to do a countermeasure, like hide the narcotics, hide the gun, stop doing the bad thing they're doing before the cop makes the contact. And then really there's nothing much to go on except for, Hey, get out of the park. It's curfew hours. Right. Um, so that being said, after 
putting eyes on it in the daylight, which I preach. Like if you're going to do a foot patrol at night, try to get eyes on the same stuff in the day because it looks different and you need to know what it looks like for confidence and safety. So later on, I guess the next shift after putting eyes on it in the daylight a few days before, I look as I'm driving and I see there's a car blacked out in the lot and both front front doors are open, the driver door and the passenger door. And he's parked in a way for hypervigilance, right? To like have view on the road. And I liked that. I was like, that's good, right? Because if you if you have something to lose, right, you're going to need to know our cops at at all time. We talk about that in class, hypervigilance and how it, that's where it starts. That's what kick things kicks things off because they have to know where you are as a cop. So I see the car and I'm like, okay, I want to check that out. It's like 1230, one o'clock in the morning, something like that. And I make the right out of view and I come back around and I double back and I park behind a business. And I get out on foot and I see the car still there and I start creeping across the road and I get behind the berm and it's about four foot rise, but he can't see me now. And I put myself between the berm and the tree and that car and I creep up and I drop in and I'm like, okay, and I don't see any movement. I'm like, he didn't see me do that. I'm like, good, good deal. Right. Just further moving. So I get to about, I want to say like 30 or 40 yards from this car. And I'm like, what do I got going on? I, Cause I really don't see anybody. Like maybe see one person at best. So I know when cars turn at a certain angle on the side street, that light will throw into that lot eventually, you know? So what I do is I take my flashlight and I quick and I quickly hit up at the car and I put it back down on my chest and I hide. And I was like, okay, we'll see how that reaction goes. I saw somebody in there. So not only did I see someone in there, as soon as my light hits in the car, I see this dude and he's facing the wrong way in the car on top of the center console. And he's like gargoyled up, just hyper just looking around, just intense, like looking around. I'm like, oh my gosh, like what am I going on there? I'm like thinking like a one man circus or something in there. This is weird. You know, it just yeah. didn't make sense. Right. Just, I see this one guy and he's straddling the center console. And then he like comes back down and he starts and he like shifts back over to the pasture seat and goes back to what he was doing. I was like, what's going on here? You know? So then I get to a distance from about you and me away this close and it's still dark and I could see that there's someone moving in the car and I hit my flashlight on. And in the moment from me to you away, I see that there is a guy that is unconscious propped with his mouth open on the front passenger seat. And there is the male that I saw like up at attention, um, actively having sex with his mouth while he's unconscious raping him yeah and it was horrible in that moment and it took me a second to figure it out because i was thinking oh do i have two intoxicated males in a relationship here and then i realized this dude looks like he's dead his eyes are open he's wow. just gone i was like i thought i had a, a dead person first i was like oh my god i'm like oh my god what i got and he tried to shut the door on me and i was working through this and i was like what it's not what you expect you know? right yeah yeah and i'm like oh my god what do i got here and i get another unit over there and and i i detain this dude outside the car quickly and i and i can see there's just there's one beer in the center glove and this dude's still unconscious so i start rolling manix over and i'm like oh my god I'm like what's going on with this dude and he's still not coming to you th- you know like when the police are there if you're doing something bad you're still going to get up that attention and have a conversation no this dude's still Lights out. I'm like, oh my God, what do I got? I got my partner over there and he's like, dude, you like, did you got raped? You're like on site rape, which is like never happens ever. At best, it's a career, you know, it wasn't a lifetime or like arrest for a cop. Like, we need to get like major crimes out here to interview this dude. We need to start figuring things out. So, after a long while, this dude finally, not coherently, but co- he's conscious again in the front seat. I'm like, okay, he's not dead, you know, and he's just totally out of it, has no idea what's going on or where he is. And we get, start interviewing this dude. And after a while of interviewing him, and he's Spanish, sheep, he's Spanish speaking, but after interviewing him, he eventually cops to it. He cops to it. Tell him what he did. Yeah, he. Are you allowed to talk about it? Yeah. He, well, yeah. He's been convicted since he's since been convicted for sexual assault and he's been deported. So like oh. they convicted him of everything. And yeah, yeah. Him guilty. Um, basically, he. And this individual both had families and kids back in their home country and they had come here and they were just working and they'd work visas, I believe. And they lived at this house, but they weren't in any kind of relationship, nothing like that. The, the front seat pastor comes to him and he's like, no idea what's going on or what we're even talking about. And he only remembered having one beer and the driver had drugged him, drugged his beer. His coworker, yeah, right? He drugged him and he got him to that parking lot. God only knows how many times that's happened. Wow. Um, it's terrible to think about, but God only knows how many Imagine, times it's dude. happened. Um, the dude eventually admitted it post Miranda interview with our majors. And he's like, well, I don't want to call that officer a liar. If, you know, well, if somebody accused you, an officer accused you of raving somebody, you wouldn't be like, oh, I don't want to call that officer a liar. It'd be a hard no, absolutely. F not. No, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Guy. Yeah, he's like, well, you know, if I really want to do it, uh, you know, we live together. And I'm like, dude, 
And he still had, and we, so we, we arrested him and in search and arrest, he still had that drugs on wow. him. Wow. Um, so it was a really solid case. They were able to convict him and deport him. Um, but, you know, on site sexual assault as a result of just walking up to cars, doing checks on foot. If I had gone in there in my marked unit, I would have probably just rolled up on what I thought was two intoxicated males in a sexual relationship. One was just too drunk. I'm like, hey, you guys need to get a ride and get out of here. Right, right, right. But I walked up on foot and saw one of the most horrible things that I ever could imagine. Yeah. And that doesn't wild. happen if you don't get out of the car and start walking around. You never know what you're going to get. You just, you never know. Um, and that impact, like that was one of my most uh, rewarding arrests as horrible as it was. It was most impactful and it wasn't dope. It wasn't guns, the stuff that we love. Right. And we, uh, you know, drool over, but it, it was a, an impact off of a foot beat, right. The dying art that I love. And I think about the, the, the police command staff that doesn't allow their cops to do any proactive work, right? Stay in the car, don't, no, no, no complaints or nothing. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's fucking wild. And shame on all those people. Shame yeah, on the media. Not place. Like, yeah, yeah no, but just, I, I know, dude, I know. <laughs> yeah. And just, just shame on all of yeah. you who, who are like that. Yeah. You guys are fucking assholes and uh, you're irresponsible for more victims in this in this world and shame on you for even wearing a badge and, and preventing cops from doing work. You're just, you're a disgrace. And I want you to know that from me to, from me to you. And, and guess what? If you change your mind and this made you change your mind, we're, we're open arms. If we've flipped your thoughts on, on what you should be doing, welcome to the team. Yeah. We'll help your people get trained, but shame on you for, for putting the kibosh on people who want to go out and actually stop people from being raped. But anyway, that's it. Dude, we ran out of time. Yeah, yeah no, and, I, uh, it was a blast. Yeah, dude, where can they find your training? I train pretty much once a month. We have a class booked, but you can go on streetcoptraining.com. Uh, streetcop.com. Yeah, street Make it easier. Yeah, streetcop.com. Yeah, streetcop.com. My class is Effective Policing Skills and Tactics. Uh, it's once a month. It's it's still a very new class. Um, but it's a killer, it, though. It's, it's growing. Yeah. It's a killer, man. It's starting yeah, to make its, its way back around for the second time to some states, but uh, it's, I'm really proud of it. I spent years working on it before I actually like, came to you and said, hey, let's roll this out. It's going to be impactful, and it's for the street-level officer looking to switch it on. Um, I'm proud of it. I'm pumped. And tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow we've got a New Jersey class, which I love the Jersey classes just because that's where my roots are from. Yeah, yeah, a top, so it's awesome. Yeah. Thanks for being here, brother. I appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. Guys, if you're in an area where you're trying to get to our classes, but we're not close to you, fret not. We actually have on-demand training at streetcop.com. You can take that course online right now. And then... You could attend that training in the future at no additional cost. You can redeem your voucher. So you get two for the price of one. We don't want to deny you the ability to take this training now, especially knowing that it can keep you safe at a very minimum, putting bad guys in jail where they belong and at the maximum going home to your family. Check out streetcop.com for that offer.